Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fifth research clinic event organized organizing by Faculty of Medicine, Bioscience and Nursing, Massa University. So today I would like to welcome a speaker of the day, Dr. Pumi. Uh, she is uh, head of the Department of Biochemistry, Vekananda College of Arts and Science for Women, uh, India. And she's having around 14 years experience and her area of specialization is uh, include uh, clinical toxicology and cancer biology. She received a lot of awards, like Best Professor Award, Millennium Scientist Award, Govind Korana Best Scientist Award, follow of Bose Science Society, etc. And she's having a lot of uh, experience, uh, as I told you, 14 years of experience in various levels. And um, she received um, a grant from DST, it's around 57 lakhs worth and she's having a lot of uh, running uh, projects and she published a lot of books chapters international publications invited talks seminars presentations conference presentations etc and uh, she's having uh, different affiliations at uh, at the university level uh, including the head of the department of biochemistry since the uh, 60s so she will be talking today um, uh, her field on you know, the anti-cancer, anti-hepatic uh, cancer uh, effect on and, uh, and uh, etc. So maybe I would like to welcome, welcome uh, Dr. Puni. So floor is yours, Dr. Puni. Hello, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Shall I present the slide? Okay. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for giving me such a wonderful opportunity. And I thank my management, our principal, and my colleagues for supporting me. Uh, in my absence, they are taking care of all my regular activities, I thank. And then um, uh, today, as a part of the faculty guest lecture series, I would like to share to you uh, related to the activities, research activity of myself with the title of anti-cancer potential of tenolipacid arsenic against aflatoxin B1 induced hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, Dr. Suresh, am I audible? Is it clear? Yes, it's audible. Please proceed. Yeah, Chris, please. Thank you. Okay, so coming to the introduction, uh, if you take the hepatocellular carcinoma, it's the liver cancer with the exposure of uh, aflatoxin B1, it's a carcinogen, and also due to the viral infections, uh, hepatitis C, B viruses, and then um, with the, the uh, so many different causes, you, the liver, the normal liver, you know, it may uh, have uh, the, for the, for the chronic level, at the chronic level, chronic exposure uh, causes the hepatitis, and uh, this uh, continuous exposure of uh, the carcinogens or the viral infections. No? It leads to cirrhosis and uh, this will lead to the hepatocellular carcinoma. And then if you take the incident level, uh, male will be more affected comparing a female in the ratio of uh, three is to one. And then uh, the this figure explains the uh, HCC content within the liver. And coming to the causative agent of hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, you have different causative agents like, as we said previously, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and also the hemochromatosis, the, the iron deposition in the uh, blood may cause the HCC. And then hemophilia, because liver is the main organ for uh, the blood clotting factors synthesis, that is blood clotting factor uh, eight and the nine will be synthesis from the liver. If you have uh, the uh, increased level of blood loss, it will definitely lead to the inflammatory condition within the liver, which will lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. And then uh, uh, the exposure of the person or the people with the uh, toxins, like uh, the aflatoxins, definitely will lead to the carcinogen. And then uh, if you come to people taking alcohol, large amount of alcohol, will definitely cause the hepatocellular carcinoma. And then uh, if you take uh, the aflatoxins, 
So the sources of aflatoxin is from the maize corn and also from the aspergillus flavors. Uh, these definitely affects and when we consume a lot of infected uh, uh, cereals and the pulses definitely we will uh, be in a high risk to get the hepatocellular carcinoma and if you come to how the aflatoxin undergo the biotransformation of causing cancer means when we consume or inject ourselves with the contaminated foods the aflatoxin B1 will be converted into an epoxide, endoepoxide and the exoepoxide. And this epoxidation takes place in the uh, liver uh, cytochrome P450. And here it induces series of metabolic activations where the exoepoxide will be converted into guanine and the adduct. And this adduct definitely transforms the DNA modifications where the G will be converted into T, the guanosine will be converted into the thymine and this transformation causes codon change and this causes series of uh, cell de deregulations and uh, this causes the development of tumor within the uh, hepatocytes, the liver cells and uh, causing the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. This is the biochemical transformation taking place when a person is continuously exposed to aflatoxins. And then what are the treatment procedures regularly followed when uh, uh, cancer has occurred to the person means obviously surgery by liver transplantations uh, and then uh, the cryoablations, the radiofrequency ablation, the chemoablations, the uh, photodynamic therapy the radiotherapy obviously is happening all over the world and people is can able to have their extension in their lifespan when they undergo treatment procedures regularly but all these are serious side effects and the uh, health condition of the patient is also must be monitored regularly but when we undergo the herbal therapy when we take herbal therapy what are the changes is possible so it is an attempt that uh, what are the herbs available in nature, if we take that, how the treatment procedure is our uh, study. And for which we have chosen uh, five different plant groups, the Cleomaspera, Tinoleptis garcini, Asclepias curious evica, Urina lobota, and the Siddha cardifolia. These are the plants available in India, in uh, Koli Hills, where we just procured these plants and then we just processed and he extracted then uh, we undergone various studies. We collected these plants in the Kulli Hills in the Namakal, and uh, we undergone. We have uh, just got the authentication procedures, and authentication of this plant is done in the the Botanical Survey of India. Uh, they authenticated the plant, and uh, hence we proceeded, and uh, we just collected the plants and then shade dried. Hundred gram of the plant extract was taken, and uh, out of which. Uh, one is to two proportion, we just prepared 50% of hydroethanol and then we shade dried the, the rota evaporator at 40 degrees centigrade and we got the plant yield of the Cleomaspera with 4.5%, Tinolepis garcini at 8.16%, Asclepias curious erica with the presentation is here. And then we just proceeded with the, the study where we evaluated the radical and non-radical scavenging potential of these five plants. And we just appraised the in vitro anti-cancer potential of a particular plant, which gave, which from which, or from the above five set plants, the plant which is having the high radical scavenging potential was taken for the next level of study for the anti-cancer potential. And just uh, using the HEPG2 cell lines, we just undergone the study. And then the in vivo studies also carried out. In phase one, uh, the in vitro anti-cancer potential of the study was done using the radical scavenging assays, the non-radical scavenging uh, potential, and on total antioxidant capacity, and the non-enzymic hemoglobin glycosylation study was carried out. Uh, the radical scavenging assay was uh, done using the uh, in a DPPH radical scavenging assay was done in the five different plants in which the 
ascorbate is taken as the uh, routine is taken as the standard in which these five different plants at a, a 200 ml concentration was taken in which the the plants were taken at 200 400 600 800 ml extract was taken and uh, the uh, dbph radical scavenging assay was done where the all the plants starting from clear mesper the slide is a bit uh, dark in font so i will say just listen the clear mesper the tinolepis garcini and the aslepius curiosavica urina lobota sida cardifolia as per the order we just uh, present i just presented here and here the tinolepis garcini shows maximum the radical scavenging potential with the ic50 value very near to the uh, standard or routine and hence uh, among the five different uh, plants chosen the the chinolepis garcini shows good uh, radical scavenging potential and then uh, next study was done on the superoxide radical uh, scavenging activity and this five different plants in which the results were displayed uh, graphically the percentage scavenging activity increases as the uh, dose of the extract increased in which the uh, the 1000 uh, microgram per ml of the standards to comparing standards the tinolepis garcini so maximum activity and then in the nitric oxide radical scavenging assay Uh, the ascorbate is taken as the standard the plant extracts of 200 400 600 800 and 1000 microgram was taken in which uh, the cleomaspray shows uh, uh, ic50 of uh, 1000 which is less potential and then uh, tinolepis garcini they it shows uh, the 560 it shows 560 and uh, the aslepius curiosavica it, it shows 750 720 as the ic50 value with the scavenging potential at the maximum plant extract shows 65.96 percentage and then urina loboto it shows uh, 900 it is having less potential comparing uh, the tinolepis garcini and then pseudocardifolia also it is uh, 840 ic50 value was obtained so this result also suggested that the tinolepis garcini shows maximum radical scavenging potential the next study we undergone is the hydroxyl radical scavenging assay where the tinolepis garcini shows maximum activity in the non radical scavenging potential like hydrogen peroxide so this hydrogen peroxide scavenging activity is maximum for the selected plant tinolepis garcini with the uh, uh, 69.38 uh, percentage and then uh, at the maximum of uh, 1000 uh, microgram per ml where uh, the ic50 value is 610 which implies comparing other plants chosen like cleomaspera aslepius curiosavica the tinolepis garcini has the potential uh, radical non radical scavenging assay and then uh, the total antioxidant capacity is studied using the reducing power the reducing potential for uh, the tinolepis garcini is maximum comparing other plants uh, with uh, 58.9 uh, and also the ic50 value is very near to the uh, beta hydroxytoline uh, which is the standard used for this study and then the ferric reducing power of the plants were displayed and uh, the non enzymatic hemoglobin glycosylation assay was done the hemoglobin gly- glycosylation should not happen with the, the administration of this uh, uh, tinolepis garcini and aspaspa aspa and uh, aslepius curiosavica these plant extracts just uh, inhibited the glycosylation potential and hence um, the power of uh, hemoglobin glycosylation is maximum for cleoma for tinolepis garcini comparing uh, the cleomaspera or the aslepius curiosavica thus the phase 1 study where five different plant varieties were taken in which the tinolepis garcini have better radical non radical and antioxidant potential when compared to the rest of the plants and uh, 
this particular kakarbetesi family the rhinolepis garcini is chosen uh, for the further study of in vitro and in vivo anti cancer uh, studies in phase 2 in vitro study the assessment is done for using the mtt assay and then uh, the dna fragmentation assay was studied and the gene expression is studied in uh, p53 bax and the caspase 3 the results is quite promising the cytotoxic effect of the hydroethanolic extract of tenolepis carcini is done on the hep g2 cell line in the hep g2 cell line at 100x the mtt assay shows the control hep g2 cells with the maximum of uh, uh, 300 microgram of tenolepis carcini has the cytotoxic potential uh, which is displayed in this uh, figure with the ic50 value of 74.4 uh, 74.5 the test concentration is exponentially increased from 18.75 to 300 the hydroethanolic extract shows the inhibition power as in a dose dependent manner in which the mtt assay suggests this plant has the anti hepatocellular carcinogenic potential it is having the anti cancer potential the dna fragmentation study is also done now. in the hydroethanolic extract of tenolepis carcini where the lon a this lon a explains about the lon a explains about the uh, untreated okay this is untreated hep g2 cells cell line uh, fragmentation and then uh, this lon b explains about uh, the standard doxorubicin at 5 microgram per ml and the lon c and the lon d is the plant extract treated plant extract treated hg2 cells where the fragmentation is done is just happened and it was done with a promising result okay and then if you come to the gene expression studies the gene expression study is done by the uh, rt pcr profiling where the uh, p53 gene the p53 gene and the caspase gene and also the bax gene was done where the t olympus garcini at 1000 microgram and 500 microgram have the promising the gene expression study was done the rt pcr show that uh, this uh, extract has the potential anti cancer property when compared to the standard doxorubicin this phase 2 study also suggested there is cytotoxic potential for the uh, pet- metabolite which is having the significant apoptotic property in regulating the genes of p53 caspase 3 and the bax gene expression and then as we got basic result promising result in the in vitro studies we just uh, treated in the male vister rat this uh, male vister rat uh, uh, before entering into the study we undergone the acute toxicity studies with the 75 125 250 500 1000 mg is administered to the uh, rat where the toxicity was not observed okay and hence we just Uh, stick to 500 250 mg per kg po and uh, 500 mg per kg ki, per kilogram of uh, you know, drug was administered uh, post mortem where uh, intraperitoneally the groups of animals were given the drugs the we have just designed five groups each having six rats uh, male vista rats and then one first one is the normal group the group 2 is the hepatoma control rats which received a total of seven dose of uh, 250 microgram per kg intraperitoneally given aflatoxin b1 this aflatoxin b1 was procured from the sigma aldrich the chemicals and then uh, dissolved in uh, dmso for seven days the group 3 is treated with a uh, 250 mg of the plant extract which is already induced the cancer induced rats the rats received 250 microgram per kg of aflatoxin for 7 days which is treated with the 250 mg of the hydroethanolic extract of tenolepis garcini uh, from 
day 7 to day 14 the drug is administered in group 4 this rats were received 500 mg and from this drug this plant extract is also given from 7th day to 14 days in group 5 the normal uh, the drug available in the market the methotrexate was given this uh, animals were grouped and in four different uh, studies the in vivo anti cancer potential was studied that is the tumor growth response where the percentage lifespan the body weight liver weight was noted in the blood the hemoglobin content rbc content and wbc content was uh, studied in serum the proteins enzymes lipid the urea uric acid creatine bilirubin was studied in the liver the lactate dehydrogenase, all the enzymatic, the metabolic enzymes were studied for both protein carbohydrate lipids like uh, LDH, glycogen hexokinase, beta D glucuronidase, cathepsin uh, D, uh, and the acid phosphatase, the cytochrome P450, cytochrome B5, uh, ATPase, a DNA RNA is also studied. The enzymatic and non enzymatic antioxidants present in the animal sample is also studied, uh, whether it is having the scavenging potential and then lipid peroxidation is also uh, studied. So the liver was the hepato, the histopathological observation of the liver cells of each group of the rats was also studied. All this was studied using the statistical analysis S, uh, SPSS version six. And here the results are displayed. The hydroethanolic extract of Tinolepis norsini with the percentage, the lifespan was studied. Uh, where the group one, which is uh, the normal healthy, uh, then uh, group two is hepatoma and uh, hepatoma received rats. As the drugs was administered, okay, the weight of the lifespan of the animals were uh, increased and it is protected. The body weight also got increased and uh, the liver weight also increased based upon the extract given and this is a very it is very promising or near to the normal methotrexate drug given uh, when it is given uh, via the regular available in the market and then uh, the rbc wbc and the hemoglobin uh, content is also studied the drugs when the plant extracts was given the the rbc the cells the rbc cells is also protected but uh, if you come to the hepatoma cells liver study liver uh, fully damaged by the hepatoma without treating uh, any plant samples that is a uh, 4.74 rbc when it is treated with the uh, 500 uh, uh, milligram of drug it is uh, 8.37 which is near to the uh, normal rats value and then uh, in the hepatoma cells the wbc content 3.20 and uh, but uh, when the drug is administered uh, the, the plant extract is administered it is 7.43 when the market drug is given methotrexate it is 6.09 the hemoglobin content is also uh, comparatively uh, raised when the cells are uh, when the animal is uh, given the plant extract this shows that the tinolepis garcini uh, induces the hepato the blood cell productions that is hematopoietic stem cells are also increased and uh, the um, cell death is totally reduced okay and then if you come to the total protein albumin and the globulin ratio also in group one normal normal rats the globulin ratio is 3.15 albumin is 5.48 and the total protein is 8.63 this is in group two this is hepatoma the group three is uh, uh, 250 milligram extract received group four is uh, 500 milligram extract received group of animals. This is the methotrexate received uh, groups where the protein content comparing uh, a group one normal, the group three is 
bit reduced because definitely the protein that is proteolysis would have happened and uh, comparing uh, the group uh, 3 and the group 4 the group 4 animals that is 500 mg received rats definitely shows the protein content is increased but when you see the value of uh, hepatoma cells that is uh, untreated animals the untreated animals show very low protein content also the ratio also presented here and then if you come to the uh, aspartate uh, transferase alt and the alp alanine phosphatase all these enzymes these enzymes uh, shows uh, the the result is also displayed here where the uh, enzymes were in the is just expressed as international unit per liter where uh, the uh, cancer is uh, cancer level that is the group 2 animal shows 255 and the group 4 animal shows 161 level that is the enzymes activity is restored after the for seven days the animals are treated with the aflatoxin from the seventh day as the uh, a plant extract was given the enzymes were restored okay the enzyme activity is restored the alanine transferase and then the aspartate uh, alp enzyme level is also is totally in and hence this enzyme this extract just uh, uh, makes the enzyme synthesis the protein synthesis re is reversed back okay and then uh, if you come to the lipid profile also, the LD, VLDL, LDL, HDL, the triglycerides and the, and the total cholesterol level is also studied where the VLDL, very low density lipoprotein level in the group four treated animals and uh, the untreated healthy rats level is more or less equal. And then uh, if you come to the low density lipoprotein, uh, the plant extract treated animal show 39.77 and the HDL level is 45, point, uh, 45 uh, milligram per ml and the, the triglyceride level is 90 uh, milligram per ml. Cholesterol is also very equal to the normal. Uh, but uh, when you see the cancer uh, containing the uh, untreated uh, the hepatoma that is cancer containing uh, when the liver is taken and lipid profile study is done all the lipid level is very high okay and uh, this shows that uh, the rats have potential power uh, for uh, with the anti cancer property and then uh, the hydroethanolic extract of tenolepis gosni on the and the CAT values and the SOD values is also shown where uh, the level is presented. The catalase activity is also studied. And then if you take the antioxidant activities, that is the uh, GPX and the GX, GR and the GST values. And if you come to the glutathione peroxidase and the glutathione reductase, and this activity is much restored when uh, the plant ex plants are treated with the aflato that is uh, treated with the plant but in the aflatoxin treated the enzyme level is totally reduced after uh, the seventh day when the drug is given that is the aflatoxin that is the tenolepis garsni with uh, the bioactive potential with the secondary metabolites like uh, terpenoids flavonoids when it is as these molecules present the enzyme activity, the activity is the oxidation, the antioxidant power of the uh, cells is regenerated. And then uh, the hydroethanolic studies of uh, vitamin C, vitamin E and the uh, glutathione reductase was studied where uh, the enzymes store, enzyme activities restored back. And then if you take uh, the potential of the lipid peroxidation is also the lipid peroxidation is uh, very high in the 
hepatoma cells of uh, untreated uh, rats and uh, when it is the treatment is given based on the dose dependent level the lipid peroxidation properties also increased but this is not in the case of methotrexate and then if you come to the histopathological observation of the liver cells the group one with a normal liver um, architecture uh, where the hepatocytes and the nucleus nucleolus is everything is in a healthy state but in the hepatoma cells the tissue uh, infiltration and inflammation is just uh, visible here this shows the presence of inflammation with the micro vesicular fatty changes but this condition is bit as reversed when the rat liver cells is induced is given with um, 250 mg per kg of tenolipus garcini there is only mild fatty infiltration present with uh, no fatty changes occurred and when the drug is given as 500 mg uh, there is improvement in the cells growth the comparing 250 mg 500 mg a uh, given uh, uh, liver cells of that uh, group 4 animals shows the mild fatty infiltrations and then this uh, group 5 is uh, the standard control positive control where uh, the methotrexate was given there is also infiltration occur so these studies shows there is a promising in vivo potential for tenolipus garcini apart from antifungal property this plant was known for its antifungal property and uh, this is the first time that uh, uh, this plant is cucurbitaceae family uh, tenolipus garcini it has the anti cancer potential is studied here and uh, along with that we have uh, undergone few more studies and uh, this phase 3 uh, shows observed the tenolipus garcini is with a uh, good anti hepato carcinogenic potential in aflatoxin induced male vistar rats with the various biochemical parameters it was studied and uh, i thank uh, for presenting and uh, and uh, this is about uh, the anti cancer potential of tenolipus carcini i just conclude my presentation okay thank you thank you dr puna thank you ah oh, thank you so if you have any questions maybe you can ask you can contact dr puna it is uh, she's a professor and head of the department biochemistry vekananda college of arts and science for women uh, trichangude india so with this we will conclude uh, uh, this uh, session so we will continue with the next session with the talk from uh, professor anam and renita just keep tuned for a while we'll we'll start in a while
Okay, uh, again, good afternoon and uh, welcome back. So, so the next speaker of the today is uh, Dr. Anam Ranita. Um, she's Professor, Department of Chemical Engineering, Satyabama Institute of Science and Technology. And she's having very good, uh, uh, very inspi in, uh, inspiring CV. So she's having a lot of uh, very nice uh, impact factor journal she published. Uh, she completed her PhD in, uh, you know, chemical engineering, and she's a go university gold medalist, and uh, she's a principal investigator for the various projects, uh, including government-sponsored projects like ISRO, SHAR, uh, seeding fund projects, SIST, DST projects, and also she's having uh, some consultancy projects also. She's also having the patents in the various uh, innovations like a portable biogas plant, safety net testing mission, uh, wind, uh, windmill operated solar um, desalinator system. And uh, she's also having uh, uh, written so many book chapters and uh, pub journal publications uh, with a h-index of 10 she published around 25 journals which is indexed in uh, above science and 38 in the scopus index journals and she's also presented various international conferences and having a lot of uh, conference uh, publications and she's also uh, having a role in the university different administrative roles it include uh, former head of department, staff coordinator, NAC coordinator, ISO coordinator, year coordinator, etc. And apart from that, she uh, received a lot of um, research awards, honors, like uh, University High Impact Factor Journal Publishing Award for last uh, few consecuting e consecutive years. Apart from that, best paper awards of um, various times. And then also Tamil Nadu Merit Award. And she's also reviewed for the various uh, SICI journals. And, and so on. So, so many, she's achieved a lot of things. And uh, she's, uh, re her research interest includes uh, alternative fields. It's very important and a timely topic uh, to have an alternative field. This is a biofield, uh, alternative to the petroleum, etc. 
uh, adsorption, catal catalysis, uh, wastewater treatment, and uh, chemi resistors. And uh, with this, uh, the detailed, uh, you know, very interesting, inspiring biodata, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Dr. Annam Radita to give a talk on biofields. So floor is yours, ma'am. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Professor Anam Ranita, working as working in Department of Chemical Engineering in Satibama Institute of Science and Technology. I thank the Board of Management of Satibama Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai, India, as well as the Board of Management of Masa, uh, Malaysia, for providing me, the, me this opportunity for delivering this guest lecture. So my topic will be about biodiesel, green alternate for petroleum-based biofuels. So what is biodiesel? So biodiesel is defined as a long chain fatty acid alkyl esters obtained from vegetable oils or animal fats by the transesterification process technically. But as in common language, we can say it to be a diesel derived from biosources. So how, how is the commercial diesel derived from? It is derived from the fossil fuels, dead remains of plants and animals. So that is why we call it to be the commercial diesel to be a fossil fuel. Coming to the history of biodiesel, we know that Rudolf, Bi uh, Rudolf Diesel, he was the one who in invented the compression ignition engine by use this fuel from the refining of crude. So that is why the commercial diesel got, uh, was named after him. So he himself, when he did his experiments in 1890, he produced biodiesel. The source was a peanut oil, which was used for agriculture uh, whereas the petroleum diesel was scarcely available at that time. So we have a famous quote of Rudolf Diesel who says that the use of vegetable oils as engine fuels may seem in insignificant today, but such oils may become in course of time as important as petroleum and coal tar products of the present time. So modern biofuel, uh, biodiesel fuel as such, the original research was conducted in 1930s in Belgium, which was made by converting vegetable oils into the uh, biodiesel, which is fatty acid, methyl esters. So why should we go for biodiesel when we have the commercial diesel? Okay, so biodiesel is a way to reduce human cost global warming. Okay, so we all know what is global warming, right? Uh, so we, we see the effects of global warming in our present times itself. We have unprecedented floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, etc. So vehicles are the ones which use most of about 60 to 65 percentage of the the, uh, the oil which is being produced as such diesel or biodiesel, automotive vehicles. So vehicles are a major source of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas that causes global warming. And research has shown that use of biodiesel reduces the greenhouse emissions by over 76 percentage compared to petroleum diesel. Okay, so you should understand what are the side effects of fossil fuels. So it increases the toxic levels, it leads to global warming, it leads to a lot of pollution, air pollution, water pollution, etc. Especially the air pollution, then climatic changes. So we can uh, climatic changes in the sense we have this floods, droughts, which is unprecedented. Whenever in summer we are getting rains during winter, winter it is very sunny so that is what we say to be climatic changes so how come biodiesel is having a lower emission so biodiesel has high ct number so which leads to less knocking less knocking in the engine so thereby increasing the life cycle of the engines and it's got inbuilt oxygen content which means it will ensure complete combustion so uh, we would have seen dark suit coming from automobile tailpipes right so all that is because of incomplete combustion which is which where the component of carbon monoxide will be higher compared to carbon dioxide and then it so biodiesel has got since it has got inbuilt oxygen content it burns fully since derived from plants and animal sources animal fats it has no sulfur it has no aromatics it it completes the carbon dioxide cycle so we have so many biogeochemical cycles right 
So those uh, biological uh, chemical cycles, like nitrogen cycle, oxygen cycle, uh, carbon cycle, sulfur cycle, phosphorus cycle, potassium cycle, there are so many cycles. In that, the most effective is the carbon cycle. That is why you're having more carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere. Okay, so as the title goes by, as I told you, it's a alternate for the commercial diesel. So which one should we prefer for a sustainable environment? First, we'll see the petro diesel carbon dioxide cycle. So we know that we get the crude oil by drilling pipes underground in wherever the oil deposits are there or as well as in the oceans also, the oil deposits. Uh, we explore that, we, we drill pipes and obtain the crude oil. Then that crude oil is fractionated or distilled to get different fractions. Okay, like say you get various products from just refining the crude oil, like diesel, petrol, methane, then asphalt. So many uh, products you get of that is we consider to be the biodiesel, which is which you are considering as of now in the discussion. Okay, so that is used in the automobiles. Apart from that, it's used in industries as well. So it releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there's an incomplete cycle. If you see all the biogeochemical chemical cycles which are in the nature, it come it comes as a full cycle. Okay, so this is the biodiesel cycle where the, uh, the raw materials are the plants. Okay, so they get the energy of converting uh, their food into lipids, lipids by solar energy. By solar energy, which is used in transportation, and then uh, it, it will be used in biorefineries and then it's used in the plants where we. Uh, deliver the fuel and then the AV transport nowadays is used in aviation fuels also. So if you see uh, whatever carbon dioxide is emitting, it's used up by the plant sensors. So it come it's come as it's coming as a full cycle. Okay. So we all know uh, carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas. So there is a natural greenhouse effect. So where of the carbon dioxide was used to trap the heat from the sun and uh, it just preserved the global temperature. So whatever carbon dioxide is getting emitted, it was just reflected back again to the atmosphere. So there was a balance. But then when the amount of carbon dioxide increased, in the atmosphere because of human activities like you know we have now so many industries mushrooming and then we have seen the rise of automobiles so naturally the carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere is very high so what happens is this carbon dioxide it just is there for about even 300 to 1000 years the way it disappears the, the amount of years it takes to disappear is very very high okay so it's there so this carbon dioxide has a tendency to trap heat. So that is why the globe as such is getting heated up. And that's why we see the effects of global warming. Like the forest fires, we often come across this. Every year we come across that so many places have got flooded. And there's a loss of damage to life, loss of damage to the, the uh, different particles which are using. And, uh, and then we, encountered droughts so that is also leading to a lot of damage to life now activities okay so what are the greenhouse gases it's not only carbon dioxide you have other gases also like uh, methane nitrous oxide allocarbons like cfc's water vapor also and then the major one is the carbon dioxide because it it forms major component of the total 100 percentage so these are the gases that trap the heat in the atmosphere. Okay, so when we see the statistics, okay, we can see that how the global temperature has been rising. And uh, this is just a 
article clipping in 2020 where we see that whatever is expected to happen say another 50 to 100 years okay it's we see it to happen in just five to ten years because of this global warming so we see that dozens of extreme events have occurred along the u.s gulf coast including new orleans and Biloxi, mississippi so they because of that you know our lifestyle everything is getting affected and our health is getting affected as well. So this is just a depiction of how carbon dioxide can affect the health of human beings. So the temporary ones are the dim sights and reduced hearing, then drowsiness, malnarcosis, dizziness, confusion, headache, unconscious, unconsciousness, then shortness of breath, then tremor, then uh, increased heart rate and blood pressure. So we have encountered these events like melting of the glaciers and then so much of air pollution in and around us. And apart from that, it's not only the land which is getting affected, it's also the oceans are, which are getting affected. Oceans, they act as a very good carbon sink. About 25% of the carbon dioxide is absorbed by the oceans. But using of these fossil fuels, that is the petroleum-based fuels by industries as well as by automobiles. It has increased the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So what happens? The ocean becomes acid acidified because the pH was in the alkaline range, but more of more carbon dioxide is getting dissolved in the water. It becomes carbonic acid, so it becomes more acidic. So when it becomes more acidic, it less oxygen is available to the aquatic plants and animals it becomes warmer just like how we get global warming less ocean warming also so you can see the effects are the sea level rise is accelerating flooding coastal communities and drowning wetland habitats then bleaching warm water coral reefs could be lost if the plant warms up by two degrees Celsius. And then toxic algae, larger and more frequent blooms are making fish, birds, marine mammals, and people sick. Then lower oxygen levels are suffocating some marine animals and shrinking their habitats. More acidic water harms animals that build shells such as corals, clams, and oysters. Fisheries, disruption in fisheries affect the marine food web, local livelihoods, and global food security. So it's because of the deforestation, burning fossil fuels in industrial agriculture, release so much of carbon dioxide, having heat trapping gases into atmosphere, causing a planet to warm. The ocean has so long as buffered the worst impacts of climate change by absorbing more than 90% of this excess heat, about 25% of the carbon dioxide, but at the cost of causing significant harm to marine ecosystems. So there's much evident by the bleaching of coral reefs, which has been inhabited for a long, lot number of aquatic plants and animals. Okay. So if we do a comparison, both of them are used for uh, powering automobiles, generating electricity and producing heat. However, there are quite few differences also, like while biofuels are renewable, fossil fuels are becoming non-renewable nowadays. Earlier, there was a plan abundant source, but now they're not having that much abundant source. The source of fuel are plant grains and organic residues. In contrast, the source of fuel, fossil fuels are millions of year old dead organisms. While biofuels don't have a serious impact on human health, fossil fuels have toxic ingredients and byproducts like carbon dioxide, which leads to global warming. Countries across the world are trying to replace fossil fuels with biofuels since the former has toxic effects on the environment, but the latest environment friendly. Okay, so we can see the relative emissions of the petroleum-based diesel and the biodiesel. So you can see the green one is a pure biodiesel, which we see to be the B100. So you can see how much of carbon dioxide is emitted, which is relatively lesser than diesel, which is relatively lesser than diesel. Then we have uh, another blend B20, which is 20 percentage of the biodiesel blended with 80 percentage of commercial diesel. Then the metallicity score, etc. You can see this. 
formal pH sulfates, oxide supply hydrogen, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, total unburned hydrocarbons. So people think that biodiesel is a vegetable oil. It's not so. And it's not a vegetable oil with some additives or it's diluted with solvents and it's refined through oil refinery process. They, they have so many misconceptions, misconceptions about biodiesel. So actually, we, we just cannot say any oil to be biodiesel. Okay, as I told you, we cannot say any oil to be a biodiesel. So how is, why is that is the viscosity of the oil, it, it has to be reduced. Otherwise, it cannot be used or blended with petrol diesel. And then it uh, it can either be blended with petrol diesel. There are four methods to reduce viscosity of blending with petrol diesel, pyrolysis, microemulsification, and transesterification. The most common one is the transesterification reaction, which leads to the products commonly known as bulk diesel. So let's delve into the production of biodiesel. Okay. Have these are the different sources of bio, uh, biodiesel raw materials. So there are four generation of biodiesel raw materials. The first one is the oil, which that's main part of a biodiesel component. So the first generation, it's produced by from edible oils like sunflower oil, coconut oil, peanut oil, soybean oil. Farm, farm oil etc so but then there was uh, you know for road over the food this is fuel debate because they're using up the land which are used for food cultivation then they went for the second generation biodiesel which was from non-edible cooking uh, non-edible oil sorry non-edible oils like jet oil punga oil but still they were they are using arable land which can be used for cultivation for other food products then third generation is algal uh, biodiesel which does not need any arable land it can just be cultivated on the seashores or even some photobioreactors open ponds etc so then because the yield of algal biodiesel is high compared to the other generation of biodiesel and the fourth generation is the uh, genetically engineered microorganisms, which can which can be more efficient as as the other uh, generation of raw materials, and does not also use arable lands. So you can see the sources of the different generation of biodiesel. So you see the first generation, corn, soybean, rapeseed, sunflower, and even animal fats are also used as uh, the as a source for biodiesel, which will come under non-edible. That is a second generation, and even pungami oil, jet top oil, waste cooking oil, all will come under second generation. And then that you have the algal source, which is a third generation, and the biologically biologically engineered genome genetically engineered microorganisms which comes to the fourth generation by diesel so when this idea of biodiesel was was proposed there were a lot of environmental constraints that is why we have the fourth generation of biodiesel the considerable debate over the direct and indirect emission of greenhouse gases from biodiesel because still it has got some obnoxious emissions like oxides of nitrogen. Then biodiesel production requires intense cultivation of energy crops, it requires more land area leading to deforestation and hence affecting biodiversity. So that is why the third generation of biodiesel has come up. First generation biofuels are rarely economical in, compar in comparison with fossil based biodiesel. 
the raising demand for vegetable oil and the pressure of biofuel mandate has resulted in a rapid increase in vegetable oil process with negative impact on biofuel costs and food prices. And biodiesel feedstocks production compared with food fiber and timber for land, water and fertilizers. This competition could affect food security. Demand for feedstock crops just maize and sugarcane has contributed significantly to global food price volatility, especially in the gain markets. So you can see here uh, the the raw materials just is used in a higher quantity is palm oil, palm oil, so oil, the rapeseed oil, then use waste cooking oil is also used as a source for biodiesel production along with that with the animal fats. So every year you can see this nature. So you can see every year is increasing except for 2015. It's a slight slump from 2022. 2022 because of course and once again arise in 2023 so what's the crop efficiency is soybeans it will produce 40 to 50 gallons per acre and rapeseed oil will produce 110 to 140 gallons per acre and mustard will produce 140 gallons per acre and jet propa 170 gallons per acre and palm oil 650 gallons per acre and algae about 10,000 to 20,000 gallons per acre. So from this result, we can deduce which one is a better raw material for biodiesel production. So to be renewable, plants must be considered due to photosynthesis. Different plants, as we see, produce oil at different annual rates. So India produces biodiesel from Chetupa and waste cooking oil. So, Jetrupa Kirkus is a low cost, it's a non edible source. It's a low cost biodiesel feedstock with good fuel properties and more oil than other species. It's a non edible oil seed stock, thus, does not have any impact on food prices or the food prices to elevate. So, you can see, so Jetrupa plant, it is dried, all the seeds are dried, oil is extracted, mechanical pressing or chemical processing. And then transportation is carried out. And then then uh, just all this uh, purification process, you get the crude biodiesel. Then washing has to be done it, it pure biodiesel. So the yield of biodiesel by hectare or jet tripper is more than four times as much fuel per hectare as oil been up to 10 to that of corn. So this is the basic methodology as to how the oil can be converted to biodiesel as does you are going to use methanol. So this oil can be from the first generation just cooking, I mean just edible oil or the second generation non-edible oil or the third generation algal oil, fourth is genetically injured microorganisms oil and the fats from the animals, animal tallow. So this free treatment is optional to remove all the impurities and that's an esterification process if the free fatty acids is going to be greater. And then it passes on to the transesterification reaction. It's the main reaction in converting the soil to biodiesel. And then purification, separation, because you get a byproduct glycerin, then the biodiesel, and then unconverted fatty acids. So methanol as such can be recovered and can be recycled in the process. So for this transification reaction, you have to use a catalyst. We'll come to that in a few slides later. So transesterification is a chemical reaction where triglyceride is reacted with alcohol in the presence of catalyst to produce esters. So we have the triglyceride, which is the vegetable oil, there's three moles of alcohol, you get three moles of biodiesel plus one mole of the glycerol molecule. So as we have seen, 
Okay, so let me. Okay, I'll close this with mine. The catalyst can be a base catalyst or a transesterification, or it can be an acid catalyst also, or some acid catalyst transesterification. So the most commonly used, the most commonly used base catalyst is sodium hydroxide because a very less amount of sodium hydroxide is required, just required to produce large amount of biodiesel, and it's very efficient. Also, the conversion is very good. You can expect. From 95 to 99% conversion. So the advantages is it's cheap and effective. It's cheaper and effective. It enables faster reaction at low temperature and pressure. It's got higher conversion rate and lower concentration of the catalyst. So lot of research has been going on because there are so many uh, variables which affect the biodiesel production. Which is oil, that is as I told you, the different generation of oil. Alcohol, so people have oh, researchers have used most commonly used alcohol is methanol. If used ethanol, propanol, and different alcohols in the higher range as well as in the lower range, and then the catalyst. So, as we have seen, the catalyst can be acid catalyst or a base catalyst, it can be a heterogeneous catalyst or homogeneous catalyst. And the raw oil is to alcohol ratio because oil is to alcohol ratio can be varied from one to three to depending upon the research can go beyond that also people have tried is try with one is to three one is to four one is to five one is to six one is to seven one is to eight even people researchers have done till one is to twelve and beyond that as well but most commonly used ratio is one is to six and then temperature so they are done with lower temperature to reduce the economy of the process and then uh, even higher temperatures also but they uh, usually restrict to 60 degrees Celsius that because it's similar to the boiling point of methanol because methanol is often used based on whatever alcohol we are using we can restrict the temperature to that but the point behind researching on temperature is to reduce the cost and the time of spill. So the processing time it varies, varies on the oil, varies on the alcohol, varies on the catalyst. If it's a very efficient catalyst, a very efficient alcohol or a, the base oil, then the time can be reduced. So all this will reflect on the economies of the biodiesel. Because the major disadvantage of commercializing the biodiesel is a cost aspect. Still, we haven't met, especially in India, we haven't met the or more or less uh, similar to the commercial diesels, very much high compared to the commercial diesel. So there will be a lot of hesitation from the, uh, the customer part if it is being introduced commercially. So still it is there in the research stage. But there are countries who have uh, started using biodiesel, the US, German, so many have Indonesia, no? so many are the, the largest producer of biodiesel annually every year. Okay, so the separation, so that's the major component of uh, the biodiesel because this methanol, since it's a solvent, it will just kind of try to trap that sodium hydroxide forming bubbles, foams, etc., or soapy formulation. So it has to be 
removed. All those unwanted impurities have to be removed since we need to uh, obtain a pure biodiesel. Otherwise, once again, there will be a lot of engine problems and the efficiency of the biodiesel will not be ha as high as expected. So the usually people go for a uh, gravity separation. Okay, so the or we go for centrific centrifuging also. So gravity technique can be employed because glycerin is more denser than fatty acid ester. Then centrifuge separation can also be employed for the separation of the end products. As such, even the byproduct grocery has a lot of applications like in soaps, as in grease, etc. So, uh, so nowadays the concept of biorefinery has come into picture where all the other byproducts value addition is also being considered to reduce the overall cost of the biodiesel. As I told you, it can be done by gravity separation or it can be done by electrically driven separation technology with a high voltage alternating current source which is used to remove glycerol and other contaminants of biodiesel in order to meet the ASTM D651 and EN15214 standards. Okay, so we follow a uh, European standard as well as American standard. Uh, the biodiesel, whatever is being produced, it has to meet these two standards to be to be qualified uh, to be in commercial processing. Okay. So as I told you, how was now after separation of the biodiesel, it has to be washed because still it will have some impurities. It has to be washed. So we usually go for water washing because the most safest way to wash a biodiesel because the other solvents we use, it should not react with the biodiesel. That's a major concern here. So water washing is a technique that is used to separate the dispersed contaminants such as campus, glycerin and methanol in biodiesel. During the process, water is sprayed onto the biodiesel. Polarity of the water separates contaminants from biodiesel. And that water can be removed. If at all there is some water in the, in the biodiesel, it, it can be uh, removed easily by rotary evaporation. Most preferred so that the ingredients of the biodiesel does not degrade. So this is an example of a alkyl biodiesel, which is, which is compared with the petrolic diesel. So we can see the parameters. Can just compare and analyze the parameters. So we can see the density is comparatively similar to the petroleum based diesel okay so as i told you there are a lot of misconceptions of biodiesel that it's just a vegetable oil or some additives added to the vegetable oil which is biodiesel it, it's not so the viscosity of the biodiesel or the density which you can see be very high to the when you compare the raw oil so that is why the starch certification process most commonly resorted to process which can bring down the density and kinematic viscosity to the comparable to the commercial conventional diesel. So the density you can see it is 1.12 gram per cc compared to the petroleum biodiesel which is 0.901 gram per cc. The kinematic viscosity is 2.22 which is also within the range of the petroleum diesel since in districts. Then sulfur content is very, very less, which is a major advantage of biodiesel, just 0.001 percentage in this algal biodiesel compared to the 50 milligram per kilogram of petroleum diesel. Water content also is, uh, is comparably lesser. And this water content is, ma is mainly based on how efficiently the process is done. It can actually be much reduced also. Then glycerol, con glycerol content, that is still there are some impurities in the biodiesel, which is 0.111, which is also uh, permissible, which is in the permissible limit of the petroleum diesel. Then iodine value 6.4. So all these numbers, iodine value, acid value, and all it, it uh, 
it confirms acidity or the gum forming tendency of the biodiesel. So if the oil is going to be acidic in nature, it will start corroding the engine parts and then the engine will have a lesser lifetime compared to using a commercial diesel. So that is why all these values are being tested before it is gone, going for a commercial stage. And the flash point, if you see, would be all biodiesel flash point will be very high compared to the petroleum diesel. So it's very safer to transport because it's many, if you see many biodiesel will be around the range from 150 to 200 range. So it's, it's a very safe uh, fuel to be transported. And the visual appearance will be more or less same to compare to the petroleum diesel. Fire point is also very much high compared to the commercial diesel. So it all depicts a safe, safe transport of these fuel. Then after finding the fuel properties, then it's the engine test. So you can clearly see that the oxygen content is very much high in the biodiesel. So this once again is a algal oil biodiesel. So the oxygen content is very high. And then the carbon dioxide level is very much less, just less than 5% or more or less 5%. And then ox uh, the carbon monoxide content is just negligible. So this is the major advantage of biodiesel. So what is the effect of carbon monoxide, it just replaces the oxygen, the emo, oxygen and hemoglobin. So it, it restrains the oxygen flow to the brain. So naturally we know what are the side effects of, of inhaling carbon monoxide. So when you have a fuel, it's not, which is going to be environment friendly and it's going to be uh, human friendly also, it's better to go for such a alternate. So it's uh, since it's coming from bio based products, raw materials, it is known as a green alternate. That's why we call it to be a green alternate. So if you see in the countries like uh, US, Germany, Indonesia, you know, they initially they did not go for a B100 blend. What is a B100 blend? B100, so we are doing blending. Okay, in India also, we started blending. We are blending with even the, even some trains are running with B5, B5 diesel which means that I'll go with B100 first. B100 is a pure biodiesel. B20 is 20 percentage of biodiesel and 80 percentage of commercial diesel. It's just blending with some additives. Then B10 is 10 percentage of biodiesel with 90 percentage of commercial diesel. Then B5 is 5 percentage of biodiesel with 95 percentage of commercial diesel. B2 is 2% of biodiesel with 98% of uh, commercial diesel. So blending is a process of mixing of biodiesel fuel with petroleum based diesel fuel designated as B, B excess or I mean dep depends on the blend which has been done which is the volume it stands for the volume percentage of biodiesel. So they first started with B5, B10 and then when they were very sure and then satisfying the performance of the biodiesel they even started going for B100. So, of course, when you are going to use a new fuel engines, there are some problems associated with that, like gums, free fatty acids, waxes, unsaponified fibers, pigments, etc. Pigments, especially since it's coming from the bio source. So, we have some pre treatments to handle the gums and free fatty acids. So, we do a physical refining, like degumming and bleaching followed by removal of free fatty acid by deacidification. Then go for high temperature distillation. Then chemical refining, removal of free fatty acid using alkali neutralization. There's a heavy loss of neutral oil along with the soap, about 2.5 times of free fatty acids. Then esterification, converts with free fatty acids to methane esters. It increases yield of biodiesel. It's the most appropriate option. So biodiesel is used in light vehicles. So light vehicles, 
with biothanol as well as biodiesel. Heavy vehicles like lorries, etc. will use biodiesel. Heavy machinery will practice non-biodiesel. And marine also, the ships and the submarines use biodiesel and biothanol. And nowadays, aviation fuels also are been, they are using biodiesel. So, uh, the British businessman Richard Branson's Virgin Voyager train number 227 Thames Voyager is built as the first world's first biodiesel train. And there's also an aircraft which is running on biodiesel. So, the first flight by a commercial airline, such so as Virgin Atlantic, to be partly powered by biofuels was a blend and built a surrounding an eco friendlier and cheaper era of airline travel took place in February 2009. So the advantages, so now since we are coming to the conclusion part, let's see both the advantages and disadvantages of biodiesel. So the advantages are produced on renewable resources. It can be used in existing diesel engines. It produces less greenhouse em gas emissions. So there is a research which shows that P20 reduces carbon dioxide by 15 percentage. It's grown, produced, and distributed locally. It's cleaner biofuel refin bio refinery. Because on the bio source, we can get n number of value added products like glycerol, pigments, then alginates. If at all you're going to use algae, and all can use alginate. You can extract alginate, carrageen. It's a good, good source for bio refinery, just like the commercial refineries where they get different products on the crude oil. The same way, all these plant-based materials along with the lipid content which is converted to biodiesel, you have a lot amount of other valuable added sources which can be made as a value added product as well. So then it's biodegradable and non-toxic. It's a better, it gives better fuel economy. It's got a positive economic impact. It's improved, it improves air quality as well. And then biodiesel could possibly in energy crisis and energy politics. So as we told, that's a renewable energy source compared to the now unsustainable source of petroleum based fuels. So the disadvantages are it can not be stored for a longer period, okay, which is not suitable. And it starts shelling in cold weather. It has water content. If uh, the processing is done very efficiently, we can reduce this water content. And since the plants from a plant source, it's got higher NOx emissions, it decreases horsepower of the engine about 25 percentage. But nevertheless, in conclusion, we can say that energy is an essential factor in industrial growth and in provision of required services that improve the quality of life of mankind. Biodiesel of the family of biofuels necessary potentials to place fossil diesel in future. The availability of major feedstock, namely oil from biosources, and simplicity of the transestrification technology that ensures its conversion to biodiesel are added advantage in terms of the future needs of biodiesel. The use of inedible oil and waste frying cooking oil is equally assisted in establishing a balance between energy and food security. Finally, serious efforts have been intensified on design of large-scale biorefineries for future biodiesel production. Okay, thank you for patiently listening to my lecture. Uh, thank you, Professor Ranita. It's very informative and uh, interesting. Uh, and we are also sorry for disturbing you when you are not feeling well, you know. And uh, with your patience, uh, you try to explain still. Uh, thank you so much for that again, once again. So, yeah, as I mentioned, so the Prof. Renita is, uh, is a professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering, Satyabama Institute of Technology, uh, Chennai. So... Thank you so much. And uh, then what we do, we'll wait for next session by uh, Professor Mansila Mani.
So until that, uh, maybe a few more minutes give us. Thank you, Prof. Ranita. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity given. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.
Thank you.
uh, welcome back again uh, so we'd like to invite another next speaker third speaker of the day dr masila mani selvam and he is associate professor of biotechnology satyabama institute of science and technology chennai uh, he did his uh, bachelor's in geology msc in coastal aquaculture mtech in biotechnology phd in marine biology after that he did pdf in marine Nat natural products university of gottingen germany and then Ma marine endophytes uh, another pdf in anamala university india so he's having uh, uh, various levels of professional experience for 16 years and his field of interest is broad like uh, di drug discovery marine natural products aquaculture pro probiotics aquaponics biofertilizers biopesticides food processing and preservation marine biology biodiversity and taxonomy and environmental, environmental protection and conservation so on is having a lot of patents around six and then is general review for 14 journals and is having 56 six research publications and is uh, published uh, uh, books uh, and book chapters in various uh, fields and uh, he also had a vast experience in research guidance guided around six phd two mphil six mtech and uh, 43 btech students and six seven bsc students so he's having very vast experience and wide range of uh, research uh, scope and uh, with this i would like to invite uh, Professor Masila Mani to talk on opportunities in aquaculture. So floor is yours, uh, Prof. You can use the slide, the, the arrow to change the slides. Thanks, Dr. Suresh. Yeah, welcome, Prof. So this is Dr. Masila Mani, Associate Professor of Satyabama. So let me start. So I don't want to waste time. So how to change you the can, slide? You can see on this on the slide, move your cursor, try to change to next slide, sir. Can you able to do or not? No, sir. I can see present uh, only. Present settings, stop cam. And, uh, mm -hmm. I can't see any cursor. Now I see the brochure.
Can you see the screen, sir? Yeah, proceed, sir. Uh, we can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Yeah. So let me uh, start. So today I am going to share my experience in aquaculture. So that is uh, opportunities in aquaculture. Before going into the topic, we should know why aquaculture. Okay. So aquaculture is is a need of uh, today in future because yes because so long long ago or for the past uh, 50 years we have been catching fishes from the natural environment. It may be a marine environment or fresh water. We were catching continuously. But uh, at the outset, we have lost our natural resources because of overfishing. So this is the main problem. And definitely we are in a position to cultivate fishes for our requirement as well as our day-to-day -day use are maybe fish consumption is increasing but if you see the natural stock it is declining because long long ago people were using non-motorized boat or katumaram etc and all but now we were we are using mechanized boat with high tech high technologies and numbers of boats also increased like anything that leads to over exploitation over exploitation is increasing year after year and that's why the natural stock is declining in the same trend our exploitation level is uh, very very high if you see the world fisheries and aquaculture production starting from 1986 to till now it is gradually increasing but if you see the natural stock, that is slowly started declining. And simultaneously, aquaculture production is slowly increasing. And uh, in 2018, almost equal with that of oiled capture fisheries. 
so this is the trend you can see how the capture fishery and aquaculture is there okay so natural fishery uh, capture fishery is limited okay so it may be a freshwater ponds lakes rivers or marine ecosystem the area is limited fish resource is limited but uh, our harvest level is over so extraordinary or over exploitation so the natural stock is slowly declining and uh, we expect in the coming years it will be very very high so obviously we are in a position to uh, search for an alternative that is aquaculture you can see the trend of capture fishery and aquaculture it started very recently in uh, 1980s only but it is increasing slowly and now it is almost equal it is predicted that by 2030 aquaculture production will exceed the natural resources okay according to fao aquaculture is the farming of aquatic organisms including fish mollusks crustaceans and aquatic plants so that is the simple definition of aquaculture so the aquaculture means we may think only fish not only fish but also the mollusks crustaceans and aquatic plants and if you see the history of aquaculture this is not new maybe uh, by using technology we have been practicing for the past 50 years but uh, egyptians and chinese were doing aquaculture for the past 3000 years or more and coming to the world aquaculture production it's increasing year after year and 82.1 million tons of aquatic animals and 32.4 million tons of aquatic algae so this is the overall production it includes aquatic animals so that is fish fin fish mollusks crustacean marine invertebrates aquatic turtles frogs etc etc if you see the per capita fish consumption consumption that is increasing year after year because of more awareness with our people and if you see the developed nations so their fish consumption is consumption is more the developing countries moderate and the poor countries even though their resource is plenty they produce more their consumption is consumption is comparatively limited or less but in the coming years we expect more fish consumption through uh, capture fishery as well as aquaculture so what is the basic requirement of aquaculture to select the species even though we have thousands of uh, aquatic animals plants so we cannot select all the species for aquaculture they need to satisfy certain criteria like it must withstand the climate of the region in which it can be raised okay the adjustment with the climate is very very important and they must grow very fastly so that is another requirement so that aquaculture will become a profitable one and uh, even though we have thousands of species we cannot uh, produce reproduce them successfully under controlled conditions only certain species so we select only those species and most importantly we know that all the aquatic organisms except uh, plants we provide with the artificial food and uh, most of the species don't accept that only set the certain species accept so we select only those species and again we can grow any species that is not a problem but that must be acceptable by the customer consumer okay so our consumer or the customer is the main target so whoever wishes to buy what type of uh, aquatic animals may fish or shrimp or crab or lobster so we can produce only that okay not for our own wish but to the consumer wish that is important and uh, when we talk about aquaculture we are growing fishes in a artificial condition 
So definitely we grow them in uh, high numbers. So that is uh, one of the criteria we do it. Uh, not all the species will tolerate this uh, high density overcrowd. So we select only those species. And uh, this is resistant is another important factor to decide the aquaculture species. So these are the seven important criteria we need to keep it in our mind before starting or before selecting any aquaculture species. Coming to the traditional way of farming, people were doing integrated fish farming long, long ago. Even now also possible, but for that we need huge space. Okay. So aquaculture means integrating everything. Aquaculture is only one part. Cultivation of fish or algae, aquatic plant is only one part. In addition to that, so we, we can grow vegetables, fruits, livestock, uh, chicken, ducks and goat or cow. We can also grow the horticultural plants, okay, flowering plants, etc., etc. But we need huge space for that. And uh, the main motto of integrative fish farm, farming is to integrate everything. So waste of one system is food of another system. So we collect vegeta vegetation or grass from a field. We give as food to the livestock. And then, so the waste of livestock is food of another system, including fish culture. So the fish waste can be used as fertilizer or nutrient, organic nutrient of plants. So in this way, we integrated everything and nothing is waste here. That is one type of farming that requires a lot of space. And another way of farming is composite fish culture. So utilization of space. Okay. So for example, if you have a pond or lake, uh, it may be small pond, big pond. Some species occupy only on top. Some species occupy in the middle. Some species occupy at the bottom. So if you manage with the based on their feeding habit, it may be uh, planktonivore, herbivore, carnivore, omnivore. So we can fill the gap and we can occupy the maximum space and we can cultivate more in a small area. So uh, that is one of the advantage of aquaculture. But in nature, you cannot expect so much species in a small place. But in aquaculture, that is possible. And we can also grow uh, fish in the rice field. So if we made a structure like this, after harvesting the rice, we can grow fish. We can convert the agri field into a fish pond. So when the water is available, plenty. And based on the food and feeding behavior, we can see the mouth is superior, inferior, subterminal. So we can grow fish okay so if it is superior they are uh, planktonivore if it is terminal subterminal if the mouth is straight so they may be grasshopper if it is uh, subterminal the mouth is uh, facing down means they are, are omnivore or sometimes carnivore also so based on that we have major carbs we have chinese carbs we have indian major carbs so that can be grown in a better way. So we can give some composition. So to avoid competition between these things, these fishes. Okay. Coming to the culture system, when we talk about aquaculture, based on the intensity, intensity means number of animals per meter square, we get the output. Okay. So we can grow uh, aquatic animals in pond, our cage, our raceways, our pen. We have so many types of farmings available based on the location and the nature of the ecosystem and the environment. Accordingly, so our management system varies. Okay, so in traditional or extensive culture, so it's construct. Uh, it is like here. Okay, you can see the picture with the large ponds, and it is. Uh, animals are not crowded, not so much crowded, it's freely there. 
so we just allow the water inside and the fishes will grow and after 4 to 6 months we harvest it but the harvest may be less but it's sustainable but it requires a lot of space so you can see the picture of traditional aqua farming and semi intensive is like uh, constructed in a per- perfect manner square type or rectangular type of farming so we provide artificial food in addition to the natural food available in the ecosystem water bodies and here the productivity is medium you can see the farm how it is located in the coastal area in the intensive culture the size of the ponds are smaller but the density of the animals are more so we get more yield within the small area but we need more care otherwise disease will come and so that may lead to uh, crop failure sometimes in intensive farm it is a latest technology so everything is under controlled environment automated with less water with small uh, within a small area so we can cultivate even we can do aquaculture in a desert so everything is recirculated so automated so we can grow fish in any environment in any condition and coming to the fishes types of fishes if we say aquaculture so immediately we remember fish only in addition to fishes we have so many animals crab lobsters etc etc and even in fishes we have freshwater fishes brackish water fishes and we have uh, aquaculture species like katla rogue mrigal silver carp grass carp common carp we have so many species uh, already available or people were cultivating for many years and uh, these fishes grow faster and uh, we get yield as soon as possible okay the maximum of 6 months is sufficient in addition to that there are some varieties uh, we say loaches very small fish uh, very tasty fish and it cost more it's very costly fish very tasty fish but the availability is very less but we have opportunity to cultivate this also in addition to the major carps next to uh, loaches catfish another uh, high value fish very tasty uh, eat this price also very high okay. and the next one is very big fish snakehead or morels this is again very color very beautiful fish very tasty very costly fish okay so we, we, people always need of these species for consumption but the availability is comparatively less we have opportunity to cultivate these fish and we have some fishes like makshir and so many fishes they grow at a faster rate okay in one year time they grow up to 10 kg in two years time it can grow up to 20 kg so if we want to produce big fish in a short span of time we have to choose the fishes like this okay. and uh, we say some species are uh, exotic so not our species but coming from other countries like sri lanka bangladesh england thailand canada vietnam usa in the same way from our country to other countries also we have uh, it may be edible fish as well as ornamental fish um, but we say invasive species are alien species but uh, Uh, after globalization it's very difficult to control the movement of uh, alien species or invasive species from here to there or that to here and next one is uh, freshwater prawn freshwater prawn they come to brackish water for uh, breeding season so they are tolerant in fresh water as well as brackish water so the the cost uh, is uh, again one of the important fishery in india and coming to the shrimp shrimp is very uh, very famous all over the world so india is one of the major producer of shrimp after china and so if you see the natural cycle life cycle 
so they are actually marine species they lay eggs in the marine waters uh, so they go to nauplia zoea mysis larval stage when they are reaching post larval stage they go to the coastal waters and after spending some months they again go to the sea so we, when we understand the biology of the shrimp so we do we make uh, shrimp culture in a hatchery hatchery we produce we collect the brooder we allow them to artificially lay eggs so we maintain it after post larva we keep it them in the aquaculture pond so the wanami so white is commonly called white leg shrimp or pacific white shrimp or king prawn so, so it occupies almost all over the world previously in india people were cultivating pinnaeus indica spinaeus monada now this particular species is occupying around the world very famous so we have more opportunity to cultivate the shrimp okay india is one of the hub uh, especially andhra pradesh is very famous for shrimp culture so we depend on all other countries export export is the main so our country is getting huge money through export and in the same way tilapia so tilapia oreochromis niloticus is a scientific name it's a origin of tilapia as nile river but it is almost there everywhere even in latest aquaponics we use this particular species because they are highly tolerant arowana is another species so the people believe uh, and it's very costly fish we say and if you see the anatomy and physiology it's very very, very interesting fish is the same fish but if if you see the uh, quality so the how fresh water fish require salt they take salt from the water and from the water through gills through mouth and in sea water they drink sea water they excrete salt through gills as well as through skin okay so this way they maintain their balance coming to the brackish water so we have milk fish gray mullet pearl spot sea bass sea breams so they are aquaculture so very important in aquaculture so this is uh, available only in brackish water so mullets pearl spot very very commonly called curry meen very famous in india especially in kerala so sea bass is one of the important aquaculture species in india and australia is the country to develop the life cycle production everything in artificial manner and the sea breams are coming up very recently and so the culture of all the above species have then and not only the culture of these fishes but also the fish processing that is another booming industry because fish is not available everywhere that is available only in the coastal area but when it goes to the interior area area it is very costly so we have icing freezing canning and preserving so many techniques are used to preserve the fish so like salting smoking icing freezing canning so sometimes people may use salt water or some preservative to enhance the self life that is also there and another uh, opportunity is hacccp so when we talk about uh, export of fish or shrimp or any other organism we need to consider the quality parameters quality of fish okay? that must be free from physical hazard chemical hazard biological hazard so these are the things and uh, this particular aspect also simultaneously growing coming to the aquaculture so aquaculture one part of aquaculture is cultivating another part is growing acquiring fishes okay so to enjoy 
not to not for consumption but also enjoy so that is also there again we have a live bearer this is they lay uh, some are egg layers so they lay eggs go for example goldfish koi car zebra danio so black widow tetra tetra so all are egg layers live bearers so they give birth to young ones lively that is guppies molies swotail platy etc etc so we have freshwater aquarium brackish water aquarium marine aquarium so we can make the environment for their living simultaneously we enjoy them so we have a very big list of freshwater ornamental fish it's a uh, new field to explore okay some of the fishes i'll tell you that is gaurami angel rainbow fighter goldfish freshwater angel arowana koi carps zebra black molly so in addition to fishes we can also grow the hydrophytes so aquatic plants so that is also gives better feeling to the fishes as well as to us so we also have marine ornamental fishes huge number we have it's emerging field so clownfish is known to most of us angel fish different different angel species the clown trigger trigger species and scorpion so tiger so lion fish so we have so many fishes to explore and maintaining the marine aquarium relatively tough but still we can do it it's a business nowadays and the sea grass so when you grow sea grass in live condition that's beautiful that uh, dead dawn also it is it is it has medicinal value it costs more marine turtle also one of the new avenues in aquaculture so we can grow fishes especially the ornamental fishes for hobby even we can do it for business we can export so we can decorate our homes your our houses with various glasses waste bottles even the sink and the office office table the unutilized tv or old tv that can be decorated with the aquatic plants as well as fishes office table so bowl whatever we have we can make use of those thing to decorate the places with the fishes and aquatic plants so not only the fishes we also have crab so crab it's a edible crab so we have so many species of uh, crab species that is edible so they are exported to various countries in live condition the culture technology is already available and uh, through pen culture crab and uh, crab uh, box type cages can be done and fattening can be done through box type cages this, this is the easiest way of uh, growing crabs so collecting small one and put it in the boxes we feed artificially in one one to two months time it will be bigger that cost more so we can export it in live condition so we have all technologies and the lobster is another organism very beautiful organism we can grow it for edible purpose or for ornamental purpose so anyhow it's very costly fishes very very costly very colorful very tasty so but the demand is more but the availability is less we have opportunity to grow this through aquaculture so not only the crustacean but also the mollusk like clams mussels perna verdes indica we have already standardized the mussel farming it grows very well in the natural waters and uh, with minimum maintenance we can grow huge quantities collection is easy so that can be used for edible purpose the shell can be used for other industry so in the same way we can also grow the oysters edible oyster the meat is very tasty and uh, and the shell also very useful 
the oyster seed collection again with the gulch material we can collect it in millions we can grow it through rack culture stack culture raft culture long line culture so the opportunity is huge and uh, as a filter feeder we can grow them very easily we can get more profit out of it so not only edible we have pearl oyster its ornamental pearls can be produced through net cages and the technology is already available with most of the countries so what we need is only the marine environment we can also grow pearls in fresh water there are fresh water pearl species we have technology we can grow them so that cost so it's a multi million dollar business so those are the animals we can make use of our uh, culture or business as an entrepreneur so we can do it so we can also grow algae we say marine algae marine macro algae or seaweed so if you see the seaweed that can be categorized broadly into green seaweed brown seaweed red seaweed based on the pigments available and they are unique not like fresh water seaweed not seaweed fresh water weed so they they may be unwanted but the seaweeds are having more than 60 trace elements and that are not available with the terrestrial plants so they also have vitamins proteins amino acids iodine bromine antibiotics etc etc so they have so many uh, so bioactive substances so they are all medically important so we can also use them as nutraceutical so the same organism can be used as human food feed for livestock poultry fish and prawn as well as menu seaweed liquid fertilizer to the plants so there are uh, seaweeds produce agar carrageenan alginic acid and manitol so they are all very very important products used in various industries like food industry confectionery pharmaceutical biomedical dairy industry textile industry paper industry and paint industries if you see the property almost all the seaweeds contain gelling property stabilizing property and thick so we can also used as a thickening agent so with this property we can make use of these seaweeds they are natural product marine natural products we say phyco collides so they are very very useful to us so based on the pigments so i have given some of the seaweed names alva entromorpha etc etc we can see the beauty of the seaweeds so gelidium gelidella gracilaria sargassum carbinaria the culture method again very easy so through vegetative propagation we can do it so it's easy to cultivate the demand is more and more now as well as in the future because their application are so many the culture is easy harvesting is easy so we can make products for various purposes coming to the world scenario so china is producing huge quantities of seaweed and japan is very famous for nori or porphyra so different countries famous for different seaweed india can also take up gracilaria one particular species gracilaria edilis because that is available plenty in our sea we can make use of that particular species we can promote their culture so we can be number one in that particular species so that is edible as salad as soup that is healthy so so these are the opportunities we have in aquaculture coming to the latest development we have so many uh, things but uh, i will restrict with one or two things that is aquaponics aquaponics is very latest technology so 
aquaponics is nothing but the simpler form of integrated farming integrated farming we grow plants we grow animals we grow fish here we cannot grow any animals here but we can grow vegetables and fishes maybe uh, edible as well as ornamental fishes through automation so we have technologies we can make use of the technology automation so we can grow fishes and the plants anywhere even in offices or house or terrace wherever the spaces are we can make use of them and again we have automated feeder we so we can connect everything through online so with this we can produce a lot so previously we need uh, manual feeder so feeding and all given manually now we have machines to feed it can be controlled the quantity wise quality wise the timer with timer everything is we can connect it through phone personal computer server so we can control online we can reduce the manpower we can produce more we can uh, maintain the water quality animal health everything so we have the technology like before we can make use of the technology to grow fish through aquaculture so finally i wanted to i want to tell you a small chinese proverb that is give a man a fish and you feed him for a day teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime so that is very very important so we can so this way we can help the world help the people for the better future finally the aquaculture is helping to save the wild life it may be a fish it may be a crab it may be seaweed or any other organism we can save wild life because when we cultivate artificially so the pressure on the natural ecosystem is reduced so uh, we save wildlife indirectly so we are also supplying protein rich food to the world so so broad we are definitely helping the nature as well as people so with this uh, small uh, overview i stop my presentation last but not the least i would like to thank masa university management and all other faculty members scientist so so he is taking care of all these thing and so they are very very helpful so i i must thank their hospitality to come over here and we are very happy and so definitely we'll have collaborations in this field as well as in various field thank you thank you thank you uh, dr masilamani is a wonderful wonderful presentation and uh, this is broad view of uh, opportunities in aquaculture and uh, how it helps the world and society um, thank you so much and uh, let us uh, see look forward for possible collaboration between the universities and uh, and future collaboration thank you so much thank you sir thank you dr suresh for your help great help in this uh, presentation arrangement everything no problem thanks sir. it's our duty and our pleasure thank you so much so with this thank we you, would sir. like to end this today's sessions thank you all for watching and uh, see you all bye bye sir